And welcome to High School Physics Explained. And today I would like to look at the basic physics of roller coasters. And in particular, I'm going to be concentrating on a standard roller coaster with a circular loop. And I'm going to be using the concepts of conservation of energy and circular motion to analyze this. So here is a little diagram here to represent our standard roller coaster. And you start at the top of the roller coaster and you like go all the way down and you find that you're traveling here at the fastest velocity and you feel a little heavy at this particular point. You then approach a hill and suddenly your velocity slows down and you feel a little lighter. Later on, you hit another depression and again, you feel a little heavier even though you're traveling a little faster. So why does this happen? Let's have a look at the physics of it. Now we're going to make this our arbitrary zero point for potential energy. Of course, it isn't equal to zero at this particular point, but for mathematical reasons, it's fine to make this our value zero. Now my total energy here is a combination of my potential energy and my kinetic energy, and my potential energy here is equal to mgh. My kinetic energy, of course, here is equal to zero. Down here, I have no potential energy, but my kinetic energy is equal to a half mv squared which means now I can establish that since my total energy remains constant, that as I go down, the value of my potential energy up here equals the value of the kinetic energy down here. So I get mgh is equal to a half mv squared. You see the m's cancels out. So my v squared becomes 2gh. And as a result, my v becomes the square root of 2gh. What this is saying is, is that the velocity, assuming that we have no friction involved, that my velocity is independent of the mass of the cart and myself. And so you can easily work out the velocity of the cart as long as you know the height of the roller coaster. But what about over here? Here I'm going across a hill and as a result of the curve here, because there, this is part of a circle, I'm undergoing circular motion, which means we have centripetal forces at play here. We have got a circle here. So if I show you the circle, we therefore automatically have a radius associated with this. Now, I'm undergoing circular motion and my circular motion is due to the net forces acting on me. So the force or my net force is equal to ma. Now my a is my centripetal acceleration. Now for convenience, when we're dealing with circular motion, it's always worthwhile to have a direction to be a positive direction. And in circular motion, we make that direction in towards the center of the circle. So what are the forces acting on me that causes me to undergo circular motion? Well, there are two forces at play. And the first force, of course, is gravity or my weight, which is going to be equal to mg. I also, of course, have the force of the car pushing back up on me, which we refer to as our normal force, which is in the opposite direction. So my net force ends up being the sum of those two forces, mg plus negative n, n being the normal force that I'm experiencing on my backside. If I clean that up, my mac is mv squared over r is equal to mg minus n. If I rearrange this, what I get is n is equal to mg minus mv squared over r. Now look at closely at this situation. My normal force, my experience of my own weight, so to speak, I always have a certain weight, but what I sense is due to my normal force is going to be less than my normal weight force of mg, which is what I'm normally experiencing sitting still in a chair. In other words, I feel lighter, and that is consistent with what we feel when we go in a roller coaster. Now, if my radius increases, then the value here gets smaller, and I'm going to feel less effects. If I make this a much sharper turn, in other words, the r gets smaller, then clearly this value increases in size and therefore what I experience, my normal force gets smaller and I feel much, much lighter. In fact, you can probably see 
that if my R gets a certain value so that this value equals the mg, I will feel weightless at that particular point in time. Similarly, if I go faster, then I also get the same effect. And so if my velocity is fast enough or my radius is small enough, experiencing no normal force means that the cart could actually fly off the track because there's nothing pulling it down. Now what about in this situation here at the dip? Again, we need to appreciate we're undergoing circular motion. So we have a certain radius involved. And in this case, my radius is going to be from, let's say, that center there. It's going to be a different value, not necessarily the same value over here. What are the forces acting here? Well, again, my weight is important and it's always acting down. And I'm also experiencing a force in the upward direction, which we call our normal. Similarly, what we did over, over here is that my net force, which is equal to my centripetal force, is going to equal the sum of the forces acting. Now, acting, remember, inward is positive, so I have a positive N, but I have a negative MG. I get MV squared over R is equal to N minus MG. Cleaning that up, my normal force now becomes MV squared over R plus MG. And as a result, you can see that a force that I experienced, the pushing upward against my backside, is actually bigger than the weight force. So I feel heavier. That is why you feel lighter when you're going over the top and heavier going down the bottom. And similarly, if you change V and or R, that's going to be changing the experience that you have. So what about a loop-de-loop -loop and you go around? So you enter the bottom of the loop and you go over the top, like so. Is there a certain velocity that allows you to travel a complete loop? Now, this situation down here is no different to what I described to you before. It's like our dip in the loop, but let's analyze us going around the top of the loop. If I'm going to stay in the loop, I need to have some centripetal force keeping me in the loop. If that centripetal force doesn't exist, then I'm going to fly off. So my centripetal force, which is MAC, is going to equal the sum of the forces. Now the forces are acting is my weight force acting down, which is MG. And of course, I also have the normal force acting against my backside. So that is going to equal the sum of those two forces. So I get MG plus N. Notice that all pointing in towards the center of the circle. Rearranging that, so my normal force is equal to MV squared over R minus MG. What does that mean? That means my centripetal force must always be greater than my weight force if I'm going to experience a forward pushing me in. If my velocity is too small or my radius is too large, such that this value becomes less than MG, I'm going to fall down. I'm going to fall out of the loop. So is there a velocity that I, I need to have to be the very bare minimum? And this, of course, that is when the value of N is equal to zero. And so MV squared over R is equal to MG. You can see that the masses are now not involved. It doesn't matter what mass I am. I'm always going to require a certain velocity to go around the loop, whether I'm 60 kilos or 120 kilos. V squared over R equals G. And so you can, as long as you know the radius, you can work out the velocity you need to go around the loop. So let's have a look at an example. So here I'm on a roller coaster. I'm being completely unsafe. I've got no harness on whatsoever and the wheels aren't locked on the track. A bit like a matchbox car going around a plastic loop. What height do I need to be at in order to go around this loop without falling out? And the principle of play is again, conservation of energy and centripetal forces. So let's start first of all, by analyzing the situation and we're going to make our radius here 20 meters because that's an important factor to make sure that I can go around. And we start by saying is that my net force is equal to the MAC 
which is of course the equal to the sum of the forces. So I have mv squared over r is equal to the sum of the forces. Now we're interested in the top of the loop. So this is the point where you want me to be. So what are the forces acting on me? Well, I have my weight force acting down and I also have my normal force acting down as well. And we want that to exist so that I stay in the loop. So I have actually a value for mv squared over r. So adding those forces together, I get mg plus my normal. The very bare minimum, whether I fall out or whether I stay in, is when the borderline is met when n is equal to zero. So mv squared over r is equal to mg. My velocity squared, therefore, is equal to gr, which is equal to 196. It's 9.8 times 20. My v becomes 14 meters per second. So there is the minimum velocity that I need to go around the loop. But the next point is to understand is I need to know how much energy I have at this particular point. And my total energy is equal to my kinetic energy at that point, plus also the potential energy I have at that point. Now my kinetic energy is a half mv squared. And my potential energy is mgh. Now let's say I'm 90 kilos, so I get a half multiplied by 90 multiplied by v, which we just established was equal to 14 squared plus a 90 multiplied by 9.8. Now what is my height at that particular time? Now it's the diameter of the circle, so it's, that's going to be 40 meters. And that gives me a total amount of energy of 44,100 joules. So that's my total energy at this particular time. And we're ignoring, of course, any losses to friction in terms of thermal energy. Since my total energy remains constant, my total potential energy at this particular point in time has got to be equal to the potential energy. So mgh at that height is going to be equal to 44,100 joules. Now my mass is 90 kilograms, g is 9.8, I have h and that is equal to 44,100. h, when you rearrange that, is going to equal to 50 meters. So assuming no friction and energy losses, as long as I start higher than 50 meters, I'm going to go around the loop. If I go lower than 50 meters, I'm not gonna make it around the loop. I hope that has helped you understand the basics of the roller coaster. But as you know, roller coasters are a lot more complex. For example, they may be a corkscrew, or they're not perfectly circular. There are these shapes that either try to keep the g-forces constant as they go around the loop, or maybe the centripetal acceleration constant. That's a little bit more complex, and that's probably the best left for a subject for another video. Thanks for watching. Please remember, like, share and subscribe. And by the way, drop a comment down below if the video particularly has been useful. And finally, consider supporting me via Patreon. The idea is to develop resources and equipment to continue to teach physics at a high school level. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.